It gives me great pleasure tonight to invite, uh, or to have rather, Murray Winkler of Lorium Capital with us here at Portfolio Metrics. Uh, Murray, we have this conversation at a, at a point in South African history where it feels like we're at a, at a juncture and uh, looking at some fairly possibly binary outcomes, but we're going to save that conversation for the end. And uh, for now, let's chat about uh, you and your company. Great, thanks. Good to be here. Murray, um, you've been in the, the industry a long time uh, in, in various capacities, various uh, companies. Um, could we talk just a little bit about your, your pre lorium background, if you, if you don't mind taking us through that? Okay. Um, I guess we could start schooling, Pretoria Boys High. You have a couple of staff from that school, um, so that's a good thing, I guess. And then went on to Wits, studied accountancy, and then joined uh, Deloitte, did my articles with them for three years. And during that time, I uh, played professional squash as well, and then went on, um, spent a couple of years in the army, and then joined Arbor Jones Roy as, as a research analyst. So this, uh, this competitive streak in you with the, uh, the squash, and I know more recently, I think it's cycling. Uh, is this a good thing for fund managers? Uh, do, do, do you feel the pain more acutely when things don't go, don't go your way? I think, uh, and it comes back to hiring people, I think for, for myself I've always found it quite good. People who play sport and are very competitive, invariably by nature they have a much more, comp in whatever they do, they like to win a little bit more. Uh, it doesn't mean they will necessarily win, but it does definitely help. So you don't like losing, so I think we definitely, we think we feel the pain more. Yeah. And uh, just a little bit in your, your formative years, I mean, so much of uh, what one learns right at the outset uh, carries through later on. Your, um, your early days at Ivor Jones, uh, what did that do for you subsequently at Deutsche and then ultimately at, uh, at Lorium? Yeah, the most important th thing when you come in as a youngster into the, any industry is to work with smart people and good mentors. And I think I was very fortunate. Um, our senior partner was a guy called Ivor Jones, Ivor Jones. Um, very fundamental, um, very smart, tough task master, master, and learned a huge amount from him on the disciplines and the analysis. And then I had a guy called Ted Woods, who eventually also was CEO of Deutsche Bank for a while, but he ran the research for a while. And he was also very pedantic, uh, meticulous, and very strong in analysis. So you learned a lot from them, and then I obviously got past the baton from them and just yeah. had to take it further. Yeah. And at Deutsche, I mean, you were uh, head of that, that, re that research team for a number of years. I think it was, what, eight, nine years, thereabouts. Um, with, without without uh, being overly uh, sort of complimentary, I mean, that team was, was peerless for a period of time. I mean, I remember when, uh, when, when Deutsche Bank swept up all the, the awards across sectors. What was it about that team uh, in terms of the people processes? What, what actually made it different to competitors in a space that is, is, is really fiercely contested? Um, I, I guess, and I, you referred to the financial mail ratings, which they used to have every year, once a year, and, and sort of a fairly decent sample, and we were number one for of the 12 years, I guess 11 of, 11 of the 12 years. And you had all the competitors there, Merrill's, um, Cities, Morgan Stanley's, and I, th I think it was the trying to differentiate ourselves on the research side, the hiring smart, it's about the people in the team. And then I guess it is the process. And I think one of the things we tried to differentiate was financial analysis. It was one of the areas that we really tried to do things differently. So you want to do different from, uh, try and be different um, from what people are doing out there. So I guess that was the one thing that we tried to do all the time. And you, and you, and you had a bit of a reputation as a, as a hard taskmaster. Well, I think also stories grow over time. Probably not as tough as I really was. Maybe they soften in your own mind, perhaps. That's true. <laughs> um, Murray, after the, the research side, a bit of a, a swerve um, from your prior history, and you actually uh, were appointed a CEO of Deutsche Bank South Africa. Um, how did that experience, if, if any, uh, mould your way of thinking? Uh, what, what did it add to your career from a richness point of view? Well, I guess it's, uh, you get managing people in different areas of the business. So I ran research, then I ran the equities business, which was the cash and derivative side, and then I did the debt side as well, which I didn't know too much about. But luckily, I had smart people um, running different areas, whether it's the sales, trading, or derivative and debt. Mm. And then, um, then the investment banking, the corporate finance side, which mm. I was responsible for as well. So I think the most important thing about is um, 
having people under you that are smart, um, loyal, and you can trust. That's very, very important in your management team. So I think it's about interacting with people and, and, and sort of trying to incentivize them and get everyone thinking along the same basis. Um, so I, I guess it comes back to management people and trying to create um, a winning culture. Okay. Fast forward to Lorien. Firstly, where the name and why? Well, the name came, I mean, we first, when we started, we had a name called Jim Najin. It was African Hawk Harrier, which that was what I was keen to get. Mm. Um, but the name was taken. Gavin came with the name with Lorien, which was based as a silver mine. Um, it was very much involved in the, around for uh, centuries and it, uh, building of civilization. So it's around core sustainable but, uh, source of wealth. Uh, and was around a long time. So that's where the name came from. Well, you mentioned uh, Gavin, Gavin Forvach, and uh, he co-founded the business with you. Now, starting a business under any circumstance uh, is a massive uh, leap of faith. Why Gavin? What, what did you see in him? Uh, look, Ga Gavin had worked with him a long time um, in, at Deutsche, hired him into the research team. Um, he is slightly different from, from I guess, the run-of-the-mill guys, um, and he sort of thinks very much out the box or differently at times. Um, so I think it complemented me pretty well. He's very ambitious, wants to grow, do mm. lots of things. Mm. Uh, I'm probably a little bit more straight up focused, this is what we do. Mm. So in between is probably the right thing. So mm. that was, he's also about 12 years younger, so a bit more energy, but he mm. still needs to run hard to keep up. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we sort of do complement um, each other quite well because we are a bit different. Now from those, from those early days, obviously, um, the team has grown, you've added resources, continue to add resources. Do you find that um, that has in any way sort of changed the culture of the firm? Adding people into the business all the time, um, you need to get the guys in. I mean, we've been quite fortunate, I think, individuals we've managed to hire. We've got a guy, Craig Saru, who also has been, probably worked with us for 20 years, who heads our research side. Mm. He was at Deutsche for some 10 years or so, and now with us for about eight years as well. Um, and it's bringing the new guys in, and it's quite nice to bring new guys, new thoughts, um, but you still try and mold them a certain way. Yeah. Sometimes it's not so easy. <laughs> but um, you need a bit of diversity in your business, and mm. um, I think that people are quite strong, strong opinions, and that's a challenge. So you get more people in, more views, mm. you decide what is the right view. Mm. Um, so and, I guess and, that's and one of the challenges, how you manage that and how you um, pull all the thoughts together and implement is it a challenge to um, manage the, the inputs where simultaneously you don't want to get into a, um, a consensus type environment that can be stalemated, but equally you still want to encourage the, um, the youngsters to input without sort of fear of um, being overexposed? Yeah, now that is, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's very important how you manage that relationship because so you don't want to stifle youngsters' thoughts and creativity. But when you've been around for 30 years in markets, you've got there's a bit of wisdom that sits there. So it's a combination. So you need to try and work with that. Yeah. And um, I guess that's a successful firm. If you can harness that, you'll do fairly well. Okay. Um, jumping back to influences, um, I, I think that there have been a number of instances where um, people from a cell side or research background have battled to transition into uh, actually managing money. For that matter, I think... Uh, a lot of long only people battle to move into hedge and, and vice versa. Let's talk about your influences. So I think, you know, the if we look at your your processes philosophy as you stated, you know, there's a there's a, a heavy emphasis on um, fundamental evaluations, looking at um, normalized cash flows and earnings through the cycle. Um, this is obviously the kind of standard approach you would have put in place in a sell side team. I look at the people, um, you know, the, the, the staff you have in the, in, uh, the investment team. I see the, word, you know, the, the letters CASA in front of most of them quite often yeah. followed by um, a CFA. Does that sort of um, fundamental accounting, working through the financial statements, um, which is r really all about rigor and sort of plotting, I mean, would, would you sort of see that that is... Uh, is, is a, a, a fundamental positive takeover from research, or do you think it in, in some way it's a limitation? Can it stifle thinking to have a accounting-centric view of, uh, of the world? Um, I don't like the word plodding. Oh, I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> have to, um, have to but speak yeah, Definitely. I mean, we do, we do have a lot of guys who've done CAs, then do the CFA. Um, so there is 
quite a lot of similar things, but I mean, mm -hmm. when you sit around and discuss things in our strategy sessions, there are a lot of different views that come, a lot of different views, emotions, how they react to markets and, and thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so there's intrinsic valuations that you get out there, and then relative to that, I mean, I think Warren Buffett still is a favorite thing that in the early 90s when he did CFA, mm -hmm. was his quote about, and I think it sums up what markets about, is um, in the long run, the market is a, is a weighing machine and it weighs the earnings. But in the short term, it's a voting machine. And that voting machine can go anywhere, way away from intrinsic value. And I think if someone can, the, the step one is for youngsters to actually understand that. There's no mm. such thing versus the intrinsic value. Mm. Um, it might be, but the, but the market can move it away 30%, 40% mm. from that for a year or more. Mm. And that's what you want to understand. So, so you um, just, just talked about how you blend this because um, emphatically the starting point is, is, is bottom up, but you describe your, um, your top down process. I think A, possibly is a, a bit of a reality check, but B, um, you as a team have been very comfortable to allow sort of top down macro calls to also sort of um, influence your portfolio positioning. Do you feel that you're well positioned to do that? I mean, this we're going to the zone here of imponderables, uh, you know, yeah. where the things come out the left field that are almost impossible to forecast. Are you equipped for it, and how do you handle it? Yeah, I, I guess listen, the fundamental what we are about as a house is the bottom-up analysis, and you come to what is what do you think is fair value for any counter, and that that that's the core of what we do. Um, we have a macro overlay because I mean, if you want to take a view, um, you need to have. A view on currencies, you need to have a view on some of a commodity cycle, global growth, what's going on. PMRs globally are, are rallying, going up, turning points. That's a check. But the most important is getting out, I guess, and seeing the company, speaking to them on the ground, and building a case what is actually going on out there. Mm. But I'd say we, we sort of very much sort of two thirds bottom up, and maybe it's sort of a third top down. Um, Probably even more bottom up, sort of 70, 30, I guess. Can I play devil's advocate? Um, you, you made a statement now that um, you need to have a view on currencies. There are quite a number of um, big global asset managers who've made their minds up that forecasting certain things like currency is literally a mug's game, it's 50 50. Why do you feel that, particularly in SA, asset managers feel they need to have a view on just about everything, regardless of whether they're forecastable or not? Yeah, I, I guess if we c come back to currency, which is so important for our market, I mean, if you look at the all share index, 55% um, of the earnings of the all share index are actually offshore. Mm -hmm. So if the currency is weakening a lot, our markets tend to do quite well. If the mm -hmm. currency is strengthening, um, it's sort of the, the rand hedge components get hurt. Mm -hmm. So you need to be quite careful in terms of that you're not too far away from what the index is. And, and we, we do an exercise where stock by stock, we will have what the percentage is offshore. When we do a portfolio, we'll measure that up and rank it relative to Aussie. So we try and eliminate some of that. But I mean, right now we'd be sort of probably relative to the index basis, we'd be probably five to 7% currency weakening um, in the stock positions that we hold. It's a, it's a check, it's a check over mm. your exposures to make sure that there are not too many macro exposures mm. that you actually, exp that you um, inadvertently expose to, I guess. I was looking at um, some of your recent hires, and uh, I see one in particular um, with very, very strong uh, quantitative skills. Does that reflect um, possibly sort of uh, more focus on measuring some of these factor exposures and understanding those risks? Yeah, the, the idea is to bring on the quant side to actually try and improve that area a bit more, um, and to, to look at factor exposures. Mm. We've, been, we've been doing that, but um, we can improve a lot, mm. I guess, in that, in that space. Um, there's always room for improvement, I guess, in almost anything we do. Mm. But yeah, definitely that's one of the areas he's focusing on, on the system and quants and how okay. can we do things best. Mary, obviously the, um, sorry from 2008, and you, you certainly picked your starting point uh, <laughs> quite well. In fact, it probably was quite, quite good timing in many respects. Um, uh, but, but certainly as a hedge fund business, uh, mostly long, short and uh, market neutral equity, those funds were very successful. Um, the challenges of transitioning to long only and, and perhaps even the reasons for doing that? Yeah, we, I guess it was driven by, when we started out, we did hedge for the first four years or so. Um, we had Ted Woods, who's actually chairman of my advisory and was previous CEO of Deutsche Bank, kept saying and obviously put a bit of money with us and saying, why don't we do all the work, why aren't we doing long only? And it was sort of quite a lot of resistance from that point of view, particularly from my side, saying, listen, we focus hedge, we'll grow hedge, that we'll do. But I guess the assets in hedge sort of probably grown a lot slower. And we said, look, maybe from a business point of view, sustainability, it's 
good to actually have a bit of long only and the hedge as well. So that is how we sort of said, well, we're running it, let's do that. And it was four and a half years ago that we went into the flexible space, which was we chose a flexible unit trust because we thought that was more akin to um, our hedge fund, the hedge fund mindset that you can move around, um, not fully invested all the time. Um, so that's, that's how we got into it. But quite a change, I mean, I guess long only quite different to hedge. Hedge is a lot more complex, a lot of moving parts, you're choosing things at expensive, uh, you can sell things at expensive, you buy things that are cheap, you can use derivatives and protection strategies. Uh, whereas long only fully invested all the time, the challenge is if you sell something, uh, you need to put something in its place. With hedge funds, you don't have to. Mm. So that, that's quite a thing. Well, let's just sell these stocks. So, well, hang on. Mm. What are we buying? Mm. So that, that, that's, that is one of the biggest sort of changes in mindset that you need to be fully invested all the time. Yeah. Uh, going back to the uh, fundamental process, um, you highlight the point that um, one, one thing one needs to avoid is, 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 is value traps. And you talk about risk mitigators. One of them is uh, seemingly fairly subjective in a way, which is the um, you know, quality of the management and inferring from that quality of the company. Um, do you find that networks are important? Do they help? I mean, if you're locked in a, uh, in a, in a, in a closed office, uh, are you able to make those assessments as well uh, as, as having the networks and the relationships with the, call them captains, captains of industry? Um. Look, management, assessing management and the history of the returns, looking at the financial statements, if you take a 10-year period, you get a very good... Uh, step one, when you meet with management, you need to understand manage, are they bullish, are they bearish? They tend to sell a good story. I mean, they're always more bullish on what the story is, generally. Mm -hmm. So knowing management teams over 10, 15, 20 years makes mm -hmm. a huge difference. If it's a bid vest, you speak with a joffy, you understand what is... When he says something, what has he historically said? So you Does it help that you used to lend money to all these guys? Yeah, well, we obviously know that a lot of the, the, the corporates extremely well over many years. I mm. mean, from an investment banking relationships um, and from a research relationships going back over 30 years, both Gavin and myself, um, and I guess myself more on the, on the corporate finance side and banking side, but we did a lot of stuff. Mm. So we know the people quite well, and I mean, when we're looking at stocks, you can go and ask other people you know if it's banks, I mean, I'll take an example where we do some stuff in Niger a lot of South African strategy into the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. And you can go and uh, speak to the CEOs of a couple of the banks here and get their views where they've done due diligences when you're mm -hmm. looking at another bank. Yeah. So we, we do a lot of sort of cross-checking with, with guys that we know fairly well and have good relations. Okay. So it definitely does help. So, Murray, sticking with the, the theme of value traps, um, the fund obviously battled a bit in 2016 from a relative point of view, um, largely because of um, you guys steered well, well clear of the resources sector, which had a, a massive bounce, um, as did many, many other managers. But looking back, um, is there something that you'd extract a learning from that? I mean, would you have, would you in future be quite as aggressive on excluding assets uh, under, under similar circumstances? I, I guess, I mean, you're right, we, we had a pretty bad year last year, and a couple of factors. The resources, I mean, we thought margin of safety, Billiton was in fact was our stock that we thought, we thought mm. things looked pretty bad. And we went for Billiton, which had a big margin of safety, mm. and that just underperformed massively when the cycle turned. So in Feb last year, when it turned, and suddenly there was big growth, things like Billiton went up, I guess, in the next six months, sort of 10 to 15 percent, and Anglos was up 100 percent. So there were some very big differences. Uh, but uh, if we look back, maybe we could have changed our positioning a bit quicker, mm. I think, with because the macro out of China changed quite a bit, and then the momentum really got going quickly. And we just stuck with our bulletin, and it was quite, these things moved really quickly. We had no golds and plats as well, which also moved very strongly. So that was where we got hurt a lot. And then I guess the other factor big time last year was in Brexit. We had quite a lot of exposure um, to UK stocks. SAB mm -hmm. Miller, which we thought was quite conservative with the takeout mm -hmm. and was a bit of a pickup. We were worried about markets. Mm -hmm. And then we had say, mutual investix. We took in a place in 10 days before. Mm -hmm. um, so Brexit, Brexit was another factor that had a very big impact on our portfolios. Mm -hmm. uh, those two were pretty big. Um, I think that we've, in terms of, We'd normally look to develop markets, South Africa exposures. We've stripped out yeah. separately the UK as one mm. exposure. So we've we've enhanced our, our sort of uh, risk 
factors that we look at. So we've changed mm -hmm. that. <laughs> um, you always like to hope you'd be a bit quicker when things turn and that maybe, mm -hmm. you know, when, when momentum starts going, maybe you change a bit quicker. But mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's always difficult each time something comes along how you react to things and whether you'll get mm -hmm. it right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Thinking about things that are superficially cheap. I mean, we've seen our banking sector trade down at uh, what would be, by historical standards, very, very uh, attractive uh, multiples. But um, as of this last week, um, with uh, the cabinet reshuffle and um, S&P uh, downgrading us to, to, to sub-investment grade, is it not a case then that perhaps those uh, multiples were justified, that the stock prices were correctly factoring in uh, these kind of risks? And that the um, you know guys who gobbled up those uh, stocks at those valuations perhaps were underestimating uh, these possible outcomes. Uh, I th think that's true. Look, the banks did pretty well last year after that. It looked like things were improving, and even this year, um, the valuations looked reasonable, not dirt cheap, but reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, and as the currency strength and bond yields came down, these banks sort of the valuations looked pretty attractive. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a big reverse on that now. Bond yields are blowing off. Um, if you look at the banks now, something like Barclays, we're, we're sort of we're waiting for a big capital raise to mm. come. Twenty to four, between twenty and thirty-five billion, we think is mm. coming. Um, it should have, we thought it would have happened by now, but mm. maybe it's been a bit held back. But that is now trading on a seven times one-year forward multiple. Mm. It's trading on an eight percent dividend yield. I mean, it's as, as cheap as it's ever been. Now there mm. is stock to come. And we've got a little bit in our portfolio. We take a huge mm. amount. We think it'll be done when it mm. does come at a sort of 5% or 7% discount, a hell of a lot more. Mm. So it's probably 20% cheap relative to the other banks. And then the other banks, things like uh, the dividend yields and things like First Rand now, uh, after their little hit, this is now suddenly on a six times four dividend yield, nine, uh, nine times multiple. Mm. Now, if things get really bad in SA and currency blows off more, these will get cheaper. Mm. But... On a long-term basis, I mean, one needs to, if one's comfortable on the fundamentals for SA Inc., it's going to provide a great buying opportunity. It sure. might be a little bit too soon, but uh, we're watching that quite closely. So we've got well, a bit fine. of exposure, not huge, mm. but... So finally, let, let, let's jump to uh, SA Inc., uh, just, just to finish off. The events the last uh, week, ex expected, but, but still a shock. Well, I guess it moves around. Last year, our views, beginning of last year, 90% probability. But this is obviously a big guess, but mm. we did have a view that we would get downgraded last year. And then the economics improved, global growth improved, emerging markets looked a lot better. And when we started this year, we thought it was probably less than 50% chance mm. we'd get downgraded. But mm. we still thought it was close to even. Um, and then I think the way the currency had been going this year and, and momentum and growth and improvements in current account and province still in place. Um, I think we, we were chatting the other day saying, well, it's probably like might be 30% probability. Mm. That's mm. how it was shifting at mm. the time. Anyway, we now know it's 100% has happened. History has a <laughs> habit of doing that, yeah. Um, so the issue is now, I mean, that's our offshore down to sub-investment grade. And the question is what happens on the domestic side. So yes. I think that's an important thing to watch because mm. if that, um, if we do move that way, now there's a lot of water to flow on the bridge to get there, but it's a possible. Mm. And that would be a lot worse for our currency and for our bonds sure. if we move that Murray, way. I've been um, writing about something that I've sort of termed the um, uh, termed end game optionality okay, in terms of you know, clearly what's happened is um, R's not negative for South Africa if, uh, if, if uh, the status quo persists. But, but clearly what's also happened is probably that there's an increased probability that we could see things change for the, change for the better. And um, sort of how we define this is possibly where, where markets, currencies, bonds uh, would be trading um, if there was no hope of salvation compared to where they are. Do you believe that um, our currency and bond markets at the moment uh, do reflect a increased probability that we might see, um, if not a regime change, because I think it's you've got to be careful how you define that, but certainly the um, potentially the end of the, the Zoom era. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it's surprising with what has happened at the currency, and if we just look at the new positions, particularly in Treasury, of people in those positions of power, um, if they're in there for quite a while, this currency should be significantly weaker. So I think mm. a lot of people have got a little bit more saying, oh, well, this is this is going to force Zuma's hand, he's going to go. Now, you just got to put probabilities on that. So definitely where we sit with the currency, 
it's it's there's still quite a bit of optimism I think mm. that things could change for the better. He's forced his hand too hard. So mm. and, and a few of the internationals are thinking that way just from mm. the feedback from the various desks we're talking to. Um, In fact, I think we saw we saw we saw uh, <laughs> net bond buying last week, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was buying. That's mm. right. Yeah, mm. and um, even yesterday, guys were sort of. There was a bit of buying that came in, but mm. uh, so those are that are uh, on the bullish side. Um, I don't, yeah. Forecasting politics, we're not going to get right. But uh, if he doesn't go by, by the end of, the, if he doesn't go in the next couple of months, I think we're going to see the currency weaker. I sure. mean, it's been very strong. It just fundamentally, mm. I think, uncertainty in that it will remain probably mm. weakened from here. Murray, thank you very much. Appreciate your time, and uh, thanks, guys. Till the next time. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Enjoyed it. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.